This classic MMORPG embodies within it an ensemble of complex and spellbinding mysteries, from legends of valiant conflicts to tales of vanishing armies. Today we discuss the top 10 biggest mysteries in Star Wars The Old Republic that left even the most competent players puzzled and mystified. Across the Star Wars The Old Republic forums, subreddit and fan sites, players have debated over some of SWOTOR's biggest mysteries, discussing and theorising hypothetical presumptions on not only the narrative direction of Star Wars, but also its vast collection of mysteries, including topics I plan to cover throughout the course of this video. So without further ado, let's discuss the top 10 biggest mysteries in Star Wars The Old Republic. Number 10 the Mandalorians were a race of honourable, war-hungry nomadic clansmen united under one sole entity known in Galactic Basic as Mandalore. Within confinements to Swotor, Artus Locke, otherwise known as Mandalore the Vindicated, ruled over the Mandalorians after proving himself stronger than the former Mandalore. During the Knights of the Fallen Empire expansion, Mandalore the Vindicated was supposedly witnessed fending off an overwhelming swarm of Eternal Empire-aligned Skytroopers during the final days of the Droman Cars assault. It is stated that in Rayla of Clan Locke's journal that Artus Locke was last seen combating a crowd of Skytroopers, but this does not reference whether or not said Skytroopers defeated him in combat. This could possibly infer that Mandalore the Vindicated is still alive. Perhaps he's in hiding due to the immense shame of defeat, which is a very common reason to go into hiding in Mandalorian culture, or it could be something to do with dishonouring his clansmen by falling in battle, and because of this he's sort of stowed away and left the Mandalorian scene. There is no way of definitively telling, but it is also possible that Mandalore the Vindicated is planning his return. He could be plotting against Mandalore the Avenger, who we will know as Shea Vizsla, and he could possibly come back one day and declare war and fight over the title of Mandalore. But there is nothing conclusive as of yet. Until we know for sure that Mandalore the Vindicated has been defeated, it is still always possible that he is still around as far as the expanded universe in Star Wars The Old Republic is concerned. Now, whether or not Mandalore the Vindicated's return is a good thing is yet to be seen, as of course there was a lot of disliking towards his character in early concept, but hopefully now with a couple of narrative pushes, they could definitely redeem this once great character. Number 9 The Revanites were a group of fanatic worshippers who followed in the footsteps of Revan, an iconic Force user from the original KOTOR game. Revan personally had a deep understanding of how the Force functions and set about constructing his own religious order around his interpretation of the Force, named the Order of Revan, based on Yavin 4. Members of said order would hence be referred to as the Revanites. Unfortunately, the SWOTOR community has more or less dismissed the Revanites due to their unimportance after Revan's defeat. However, the remaining Revanite force is actually still a considerable threat to the galaxy, featuring both Republic and Imperial defects with considerable knowledge of Imperial and Republic secrets, which could damage their respective factions. Accompanying these defects are remnants of the Nova Blade Pirates, a dominating pirate force from the planet Rishi, and Mandalorians of Clan Far who committed Darmanda, these being Mandalorians who did not heed the call of Mandalore the Avenger. So the big question is, did the Revanites reunite over the five year period between Shadow of Revan and Knights of the Fallen Empire? Are they still their own faction even? Or did they perhaps disband and splinter cell back into their own respective factions being the Republic, the Empire, Pirates, Mandalorians, etc. There's no way of definitively telling until Charles Boyd or one of the creative writers comes and clarifies this subject, but hopefully we're going to hear about them sometime soon with the upcoming 6.0 expansion. Number 8 Update 5.9 brings an array of new content to the game, from the flashpoint known as the Nathama Conspiracy to the return of beloved companions such as Felix, Akavi Spa, and Mako. But with patch 5.9 comes the addition of this rather peculiar pirate known as Paxton Roll, who is, according to Charles Boyd, a tricksy pirate who's prone to mischief and is not supposed to be in the game as of yet. He's simply a work in progress promotional item meant for some point later in the year. Um, as stated, he's merely an oversight, but the oversight is surprisingly functional, as it is possible to interact with the pirate and even fully unlock the achievement, which is not normally possible, especially with oversights in the past. So it begs the question, um, is Paxton Roll just some pirate, or does he have some bigger part to play in the narrative of 6.0? Is this simply his cameo, perhaps? Only time will tell, really, but hopefully we're going to learn a little bit more about him in the upcoming expansion. I got no Yachowski, no Yokochuso de Mate Chichoya. I got no Yachowski, no Yokochuso de Mate Chichoya. I got no Yachowski. Number 7. 
Throughout the God from the Machine operation, players combat various mythological gods, each with their own set of unique abilities and respective mechanics. What the game fails to clarify is why Skyver actually assists the Outlander in slaying Isaac, the final boss, during his boss encounter. To shine some light on this subject, Skyver serves as the mother of the machine gods. This includes Tithe, the sisters NC and Anivia, and of course, Nort, whom the Outlander successfully defeats during the operation. Skyver, being their mother, is furious at the Outlander, and demonstrates this with such lines as I will guide you to your destruction, and you will be neutralized, during her specific boss encounter. The reason as to why she then supports the Outlander is not mentioned, but players have assumed it has some association with the yet-to-be-complete Scion story arc featuring at the beginning of the operation. As to why Skyver betrays her homeworld, we do not yet know. All we can do is simply assume. With regards to the Skyver mystery, data miners have in fact extracted official documentation from the game's patch files that basically contextualizes Skyver's motives. Now, the game files in question, however, were cut from the final release of patch 5.8 for undetermined reasons. These game files, in summary, state that Skyver didn't want Isaac to commit another genocide, and therefore Skyver helps the Outlander stop him. But because these game files were removed just before patch 5.8 was released, there is no way of determining whether or not this was the actual narrative direction Charles Boyd and the writing team wanted to take. Number 6 since the Hut epilogue featured during the Rise of the Hut Cartel expansion, there has been little to no reference of the current state of the Hut Cartel, other than Orgrub's unstable pact with the Republic and more recently the Eternal Alliance, as referred to in multiple codex entries. After Taboro the Supreme Morgul's demise on Makeb, there have been no other potential Hut leaders. Therefore, the big question is, who could be the Supreme Morgul of the Hut Cartel currently, and what is the state of the Hut Cartel to boot? Currently in law, there are very few huts beside Garada, but come on, let's be real, with the right to take the mantle of Supreme Morgul, as most other candidates, including Kraga, Sajin, Nemro, and Taboro, were killed off in their respective storylines, leaving only a few remaining huts with significant authority. With this being said, however, there is one hut featured alongside the Deathmark Conquest event who has no established background, named Naboro, who simply functions as a quest receiver of the untraceable credit lockbox from the Bribe the Huts conquest objective. This NPC has puzzled players for the last few months, and has left a lot of guilds rather stymied as to who the Hut could be. Based on his position in Outlaw's Den, he could arguably be the Kartar representative on Tatooine at the time, putting him in a very similar position to Jabba, post Old Republic. Although he could just be some random Hut, there's no real way of telling. There has however been some speculation that he could possibly be on the Hut Council, or a Hut Defect who's smuggling credits in an attempt to fight the Eternal Alliance, the hut is truly quite the mystery. Let's hope the developers give us some context sometime in the near future as to who this hut could possibly be. Number 5 During Night of the Eternal Thrones Chapter 7 Into the Void, the player is introduced to Valkorion's Vault, a secret storage unit filled with priceless Sith artifacts from the fallen world of Nathema. During the Outlander's assault on the facility, the vault is completely obliterated, leaving little more than a husk of what could have been. The treasured artifacts are henceforth presumed lost. Until recently, however, with the new Nathema Conspiracy Flashpoint, where players delve back into the remains of this ancient facility in an attempt to overthrow the Order of Zildrog. During this Flashpoint, players received a bonus mission called Seeker of Fortune, where players had to locate seven of Valkorion's long-forgotten treasures. Unfortunately, players received a minuscule reward of 150 CP upon completing the quest, leaving many players speculating that perhaps the chests have a secret function or purpose. Whether or not this is the case is mostly unknown to the community, but to receive such a small reward for such an effortful task makes little sense. Which leads me to believe that perhaps the Nathema Flashpoint has more secrets than meets the eye. Hopefully we'll find out the true secrets of Valkorion's Vault in an upcoming expansion, possibly 6.0. Number 4 Ever since the rise of the Hut Cartel expansion, we've known resources for both the Republic and Empire are dwindling, to say the least. More recently, however, with Knights of the Fallen Empire and Knights of the Eternal Throne, players have discovered that in fact the resource crisis is much graver than originally theorised, and both factions are now scavenging their own worlds to the bone in an attempt to gather more materials for the war effort. During the Flashpoint, a trader among the Chiss, the player base learnt that both the Republic and Empire are doubling down on the war effort, but the extent to which is not yet clarified. It is possible that by now, the Republic and Empire have finally gathered the resources they need to engage in a full-scale war. But the question is, are either side truly ready, or is more time required? 
Based on the rumors of the upcoming 6.0 expansion, it is believed that the basis of content featured throughout 6.0 will resolve around this upcoming conflict between the two factions. But this, if anything, raises more questions than it answers. Who are the faction's leaders? Who's winning the war currently? What's happened to the Jedi Order and the Sith Empire? Are there even any Force users left? Hopefully this question will be rectified in time. Definitely gives us something to look forward to when 6.0 finally drops. In extension of this, will 6.0 reveal the much anticipated conclusion to the Iocath storyline concerning the Asina Malcolm paradox, or will it simply push the former story to the side and move on, similarly to the Makeb arc and of course the Revan arc? Now, we can only hope for the prior, but again, we'll have to wait and see. Number 3 Zildrog is the epitome of ancient power, having roots on both the machine world of Iocath as well as the Alliance superweapon known as the Gravestone. With Zildrog's power, we can deduce that not only can Zildrog exterminate whole planets, but Zildrog can also absorb the force energy of each planet and give said energy to a given user, explaining not only Vin Artis's power, but Valkorion's as well. This ability to destroy and devour planets is not the only reason that Zildrog is considered to be as strong as he is. There are actually strong connotations within SWOTOR that link Zildrog and Isaac the Devourer together. This is actually due to a misinterpretation by the Zuculian people and even other narrative links featured throughout their codex entries that supposedly bind both Zildrog and Isaac together as one. This could actually infer that Zildrog and Isaac are one in the same. Perhaps Zildrog is sort of the brain and Isaac is kind of the weapon or the body, which if it's the case, this would infer that Zildrog is the strongest being yet to be featured in the SWOTOR EU, having powers similar to Valkorion even. I mean, likewise we could argue that Isaac and Zildrog could be separate entities altogether because there's nothing conclusively in lore saying that they are one, but in lore right now, as far as we know, there are only a handful of people that know indefinitely whether or not Zildrog and Isaac are one and the same, and that is Skyver, the Gemini droid, so possibly Scorpio if you left her alive in your campaign, and Valkorion who, as far as we know, is deceased. So, if this is the case, then Zildrog could potentially be a ridiculously overpowered godlike being. If um, it's not the case and Zildrog is still his own separate entity, that still infers that he is incredibly powerful. Having the ability to simply wipe out planets just by sacrificing three people is incredibly impressive and I think by far until it's been established it is a big mystery within SWOTOR how powerful Zildrog actually is. Number two. As Knights of the Eternal Throne came to its denoma, Vitiate fell, leaving behind the spirits of Valkorion's children, Arkan and Valen. Arkan returned to his former body, whilst Valen, our prime antagonist figure, was left to decide her own fate. To elaborate, Valen either returned to her former self, or simply accepted her defeat at Valkorion's hand. Both of which are likely scenarios, but based on Valen's epiphany towards the end of Kotet's narrative, one questions if she let her soul diminish at all. I mean, come on, if you are in her shoes, you'd want to make amends for your crimes. Therefore, it is perfectly plausible that Valen took on a new visage and may return in an upcoming expansion, as creative director Charles Boyd has actually possibly suggested in Volk's interview. There has, however, been much controversy on this subject, as some argue, especially on Reddit, that Valen is not powerful enough to take on a host form independently, whilst others, such as myself, believe not only that Valen is powerful enough, but that she is also capable of returning in an upcoming expansion. She may possibly be a force ghost awaiting some resolution on Nathema, but I am almost certain that she is planning to make a return. Now, this is not known for sure, as only the creative team at Bioware knows, but if you think about it, it makes sense for Valen to return, as there is a lot more story and context around her backstory that we do not yet know about. Number one. At the launch of the original Cinematic Sacrifice, players at E3 sat in R at what would become the next big Star Wars expansion. Said expansion featured a narrative-driven story arc that each player could customise to fit their own playstyle, which enabled Sith Lords like myself to have some fun and kill off companions, for example Quinn in the Iocath expansion. This giant unveiling was actually topped off with what some consider to be the icing on the cake, and that was a Malgus reveal, suggesting Malgus could possibly return in the near future, at some point during Kotef or Kotet. But fans were shockingly disappointed as EA and Bioware decided to re-edit the Sacrifice trailer and cut the scene of Malgus from the actual cinematic. Now, because of this sudden cut, there has been a lot of controversy around the subject matter because some fans have actually theorized that the clip was used sort of politically incorrectly to generate marketing hype around the Knights of the Fallen Empire expansion, whilst others, including myself, believed it was the original direction of the Kotev story, but due to complications, perhaps voice actor based or potentially narrative driven, they decided to cut Malgus for good reason. 
Now, there is no way of telling whether or not this is the case, but it is possible that they may have actually used this sort of cutting technique to generate hype in the wrong way. But regardless of Bioware and EA's motive, it has still left fans wondering for the last three years as to whether Malgus will make a return at some point in the MMO's lifespan. This could possibly be in 6.0, but again there's no way to be sure. This Malgus dilemma is truly one of SWOTOR's biggest mysteries, and you have to wonder if it will ever be resolved. And there we have it, the top 10 biggest mysteries in Star Wars The Old Republic. Thank you very much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lore Online, and as always, you're more than welcome to comment any feedback, ideas or suggestions in the comment section down below. I'll be sure to give it a read. It really, really helps. Uh, in addition, my Swoto referral link is in the description. It's completely free to use and it helps me get cartel coins to create the more cartel market focused videos, such as my like top 10 armor sets and stuff like that. Anyway, again, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next time. Bye guys.